Good morning. I hope you are all well caffeinated because we're going to do a fairly deep dive into ZFS this morning to understand some optimizations that Spectrologic has done in its efforts to optimize ZFS for block storage. I'm Justin Gibbs of Spectrologic, and we also have... I'm Will Hendricks, also of Spectrologic. So today we're going to do a quick overview of ZFS internals, hopefully enough to give you sort of a framework for understanding what we've done. We'll talk about the motivation for the work, the three major optimizations that we've done. We've also fixed a lot of other bugs and, and done some minor, minor other things that uh, will be covered in a paper later, but um, just the three, probably enough for an hour. We'll talk about how we validated all of our changes, the performance results, some additional commentary and reflection on what we've done, and also some acknowledgement. So ZFS is like the equivalent of a Reese's peanut butter cup to an engineer. Uh, I don't know if you are uh, old enough to remember the, the uh, ads. You know, you'd have some well-dressed people, you know, one with a chocolate bar, one with a, piece of, with a peanut butter, a jar of peanut butter, and you'd say, oh, you've got chocolate in my peanut butter, and oh no, you've got peanut butter in my chocolate. Well, in this case, we've got RAID in your file system and file system in your volume manager, and all of it comes together and actually becomes quite tasty, um, just like a Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. But ZFS also has a lot of other great uh, features. All the standard buzz buzzwords are there, snapshots, deduplication, encryption, uh, the ability to do synchronous write journaling, um, adaptive tiered caching, all these things that make it a very interesting subsystem to use to create an embedded appliance. And that's what Spectrologic is using FreeBSD uh, and the ZFS port uh, to FreeBSD in our product. So here is a very simplified diagram of ZFS. At the very top, you have a presentation layer that takes all of um, what is basically an object-based system and presents it for different uses. On the left, you've got the ZFS POSIX layer. That's what gives us your normal file system semantics. ZFS volumes, that's a way to take an object and present it as a piece of block storage, for perhaps as a, a, a disk image for a virtual machine, or to be exported over Fiber Channel or iSCSI to an external consumer. <coughs> Projects such as Luster actually tie into ZFS at this level and operate using native ZFS objects in order to gain uh, excellent performance. and uh, add a level of clustering capability on top of ZFS. And uh, the CAM target layer, uh, this is uh, another avenue besides going through uh, a ZFS volume to be able to take a ZFS object and export it to somebody externally over fiber channel or another transport. In the middle, we have the data management unit. This is where ZFS manages its objects, makes sure that those objects remain coherent, uh, where it's transaction engine for rolling objects forward and backward. All of that uh, technology occurs in the data management unit layer. And then down below that you have the storage pool allocator, which takes those objects, converts them into actual physical disk locations, performs RAID transforms on them, and gets them out to disk. All of Spectrologic's optimizations have happened in the data management unit layer. So a few other topics that we need to understand to be able to talk about what we've done to ZFS. ZFS operates on records. And those records can be anywhere from 512 byte all the way up to uh, 128 kilobytes in size. There's a checksum recorded um, or taken on that record and also recorded up in the file system away from the data so that it can't be corrupted if the block is overwritten. And Checksums for these records are verified every time that we do a read. So you, you know that what you wrote uh, is what you've read back. But all the operations happen on these ZFS records. So if you want to write one byte, the eventual I.O. to the underlying storage pool will be a, a ZFS record. ZFS also operates as a copy on write file system. So ZFS will never directly overwrite an existing block. 
it always creates a new version of the entire storage pool um, by writing the modified records to previously unallocated space. And then it uses the same kind of database style transaction processing to roll the file system atomically forward to the next version. The free space that is used to write, uh, that is freed up, that are based on the older version of the file system will eventually be reclaimed by ZFS and used for future versions of the file system. So ZFS operates, as I said, on transactions. Each write that we perform to the, data, or to the file system, just like it is in databases, uh, gets assigned a transaction. And, but if we were to commit each of these transactions independently, we'd have very terrible performance. And so they're batched up into these things called transaction groups. And as we do in CPUs and lots of other things in computer science, we pipeline the commit of these transaction groups so that we can keep the I.O. subsystem saturated. So we have several transaction groups in flight uh, at the same time at different states of their lifetime. And we basically step them through in parallel. Um, and we'll see a, another diagram in a few slides here to talk a little bit more about that. So the three different types of transaction groups that we have in flight at the same time is the open transaction group. That's where uh, user data changes occur. That's why it says most changes occur here. Uh, when we modify metadata and some of the other objects within the file system that are kind of hidden from the user, those can happen in other transaction groups. Uh, the quiescing tra transaction group is where we're waiting for all the writers to exit so that we know that there's no data in flight to in-core or in-memory buffers before we start writing them to disk. And then the syncing transaction group is where all the I.O. is occurring to get that data down into the disks. So let's see what happens when we do a copy on write activity in the file system. Uh, in this diagram, the three ellipses that you see up here are to, note, to denote the fact that when we come down through the file system, uh, we have kind of collapsed a few layers in trying to get to this bottom object that we're talking about. So here is the root of the storage pool. This is uh, you know, where everything starts in ZFS. It's called the Uber block. We've gone through some translation layers to be able to find a specific object of interest. Uh, this particular object that we're looking at, just like all objects in the system, have a DMU node. That is the root of an object. And then we have indirect blocks which basically allow us to add levels of indirection between the DMU node and the actual data blocks, depending on how much data we need to reference. When a, an object is very, very small, we might be able to directly uh, link the DMU node to the data, data blocks that excuse me, represent that particular object. And then as it grows, we add these levels of indirection. So what we're going to do now is we're going to pretend that we're doing a write to a block. So here comes the write. No matter what size it is, whether it's one byte or it's a full data block record in size or it spans multiple data blocks, we still have to do the same operations. We have to replace this data block. And because the data block checksum is not stored there, it's actually stored in the indirect block. And we've also moved the location of that data block to some other place within the storage pool. We need to update that metadata in the indirect block. So we now had to copy the old data into a new buffer and, and create a new version of the indirect block. This will occur all the way up the graph, however many levels of indirect blocks there are, depending on the size of the object, uh, until we get to, whoop, I went the wrong way, uh, until we get to the uh, DMU node, where we have to record things like the axis time has changed, or the, maybe the object size has changed, or the indirect block size has changed, or the data block size has changed. All these different things about an object that could change as a result of modifying uh, uh, just one block of data there. And eventually, when we go and batch all of these changes into a transaction group and commit them to disk, the Uber block at the top will also be revved. And we will now have a coherent new path into this kind of hybrid new version of the pool where some of the blocks are new and some of the blocks are from the previous version. 
but it gets a little bit more complex than even that. We have to be able to keep track, since we're doing this pipelining, to make sure that we keep the I.O. subsystem saturated, of all the different versions of this particular object in ZFS at the same time. So in, in this graph, we see time progressing to the left. So new stuff is happening as we go further and further to the left. We have a syncing transaction group. This is where the syncer is actively taking uh, committed data that's in memory that we know is, is not changing in any way and writing that out to disk. The quiescing transaction group is where we're waiting for all the writers to finish their final updates to those buffers. And the open transaction group here is where we're allowing new writes to take place. Every time that we modify a block in a new transaction group, we have to record what we're doing. And the way we do that is with a dirty record. So the syncing transaction group has a dirty record. It understands what portions of the buffer have been changed and things like that. Same thing for the quiescing. Same thing for the open transaction group. And what you can do between these different transaction groups can be pretty radical. So in, in this kind of simpler example, the two purple bars that we have down here, that's the only portion that we've written. The black area is existing data that we already had in, in core and we've only modified the bands that you see there. In the quiescing transaction group, a little time later, somebody came along and wrote the blue area and has gotten rid of some of the purple. And in fact, in the open transaction group, somebody came in and just replaced the data wholesale. But you can imagine things like truncates, writes, um, and there's even an, a state called nofill in ZFS where you can basically make sure that I.O. never occurs and, and goes to the disk. So, there's just a lot in flight at, at the same time that we all have to keep in mind while we're trying to modify the way that, that ZFS does its work. This pointer here is the current version. So ZFS is always tracking kind of what the head of the file system looks like in, in core. And that's where readers come in. The readers always come in and see the, the head version of the file system. So now we're going to do a little performance demo that, uh, again, this is going to start with ZFS as we've described it here. This is the unaltered version that we've described. And then we'll, we'll see what happens. OK. Uh, so for that, I'm going to first of all do to a uh, live session. And basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, demonstrate what happens when you write out a uh, block object and keep it unallocated, what happens then, versus what happens if you're writing out to a block object that's already been allocated. So I'm going to show you how that, what happens with that. So I Loading the kernel uh, uh, module for um, ZFS as it is in previous two head today. Then I'm going to reinforce the pool that I had open. Things like this always happen during demos. Yeah. So first I have to figure out what the good the tool that I created was. See here that I've already created a uh, 10 gigabyte uh, Z ball 
and this object had been fully allocated. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to create a new line of identical uh, collected, collected set. Okay, and then over here I have a deep wall high of that. And the idea I have is to show um, the operations that are occurring while I'm doing the IOP. So, so you'll see here that I started a DD, and what that will do is just writing out a block of zero, one megabyte in size at a time. And you'll see right now that it's uh, writing them out very quickly. You will also notice that um, they, the, the, the song that they did out uh, the read, and right now it's doing no read at all. And the reason for that is because the FF doesn't have to read in the whole block. It's just writing out new blocks. Because uh, when you created the hub, that it was unallocated to begin with. So I'm going to cancel that. So you'll notice here that I am writing up that thin pattern of uh, one megabyte of the to the previously allocated object in the effect. And you'll see here that the performance is more or less identical to what we saw with the uh, unallocated version. But here's the problem. I'll cancel this. I'll change the black bag to Bolte. And uh, remember, Justin was talking about um, the DFS record size. And in DFS, the record size for the object is 128 kilobytes. So by writing out the black Bolte at a time, I'm writing out less than the record size. And so what DFS, at least if it stands today, will do is it will try to read the old block because the block gets copied to a new block and then they get updated with the modifications that we make. So you'll notice here that um, first column that has numbers is the rage. See how there's a whole lot of rage all of a sudden. And previously, when I was doing the large rights to an allocated <laughs> object, and the large rights to an allocated object, I didn't have any rage at all. So you'll see how the performance kind of segues like this. And obviously, that's uh, suboptimal. <coughs> so what, 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 I'll, what, I, what I will do is I will show um, what the effect of uh, changes. So I have reloaded the uh, module with the same clip, and I'm re-importing the same pool. So I have uh, the object that I created previously. I'm going to write out. I'm just going to go to the object that been previously allocated <coughs> to demonstrate the difference. You started the IO stat. So you'll notice here the rays are much smaller than they were before. Previously, we had rays that were in the hundreds of rays per second, and now we have maybe 10. And all of those are uh, interact block rays. So remember, um, Justin was saying that with the DMU node and the data hub, that you have to read the interact block. And that's actually suboptimal, but we'll talk about that later. But you can see now we're getting performance that's much closer to what it's like 
when you have uh, an, an object um, that's already fully allocated, even if you are doing less than that exercise bytes. So, um, the performance analysis that you did, we tracked the problem down to this function. So, what's happening is that when we're writing out an existing block, we have to mark it as dirty. And the reason for that is so that you have the dirty record that when the transaction reaches the sink, so you know how we need to sink it to death. So, you'll notice the problem line is right here. This line, what this does is it reads the whole version of the block synchronously. This means that if you, if you aren't completely throwing the original block, what it's doing is it's blocking the write just to read the whole version of the block, even if you might not actually need that old version. So, why does the DFS read and write? It's very, very simple. Um, let's traditional about this thing, what you're doing is you're writing out the data to the same block where you had the original data. So you don't actually have to read the whole version in order to merge the new version on top of it. So what's happening is that um, this is performing what's called a copy and write fault by reading the whole version and then proceeding to a cache state where it can then update only the parts of the buffer that you are modified. So, the problem with that is that block consumers generally in their steady state, they will have fully allocated all of their object space. So, in the steady state, they're always overwriting all data. Um, Bio, I know, on the other hand, Bio have that role generally um, either be copying, copying and write inside the application itself. So for example, if you're editing a text file in them or Emacs or whatever, <coughs> you've got the whole thing in your buffer, and you're just writing out the whole thing to this. So you don't actually have to do the copy and write for that. And um, with a lot of other file types in that overwriting existing blocks, you're just you're appending the file or you're truncating it, so you don't incur this kind of problem. So the question is, if you're, if you're just replacing the whole block, why should you have to read in the original block ever? And the other question is, why force the writer to write for the read data? It, it could very well be done in parallel. So um, we're going to talk about the optimization um, with that context. I will let Justin take over. <laughs> So like all good uh, computer scientists, I mean, one of the first things that we learn in school is uh, procrastination pays off, right? And, uh, and also try to be concurrent. And those are the two things that we're going to talk about here. Of course, um, as anybody who has worked on file systems, and I'm kind of new to this area in the last eight months or so, yeah, you never say that. <laughs> So let's look at how the uh, data management layer uh, goes through these state transitions for how we modify a ZFS record. So here's the existing state diagram. You can actually find this in uh, debuff.h, I think, in the um, in ASCII art version. Uh, and it's actually pretty straightforward. When you first go to access a record, you allocate a debuff object to track what you're doing with it. It's in the uncached state. You can either um, perform a read to go find out what the underlying data is for that record, or you can say, I'm going to write the whole thing, and that's a fill. Okay. So you go through either of those two paths. A read will go to the read state. The read will be synchronously issued. When the read completes, you go to the cache state. If you're a filler and you've said that I'm going to completely replace the block, you basically return immediately to the fill. Uh, you mark the debuff as being in the fill state. You return to the writer, you finish your write, and then you say, I'm done writing, and that transitions you to the cache state. 
Sometime later, when there's nobody actively modifying the record, you'll evict the, the uh, debuff, the DMU buffer, and go to the evict state, and then tear everything down, and the thing disappears. The lifetime of a DMU buffer, though, is shorter than the cache. And uh, it's not really tied to the optimizations that we've done here, but just to make it clear, only while you're, you're referencing these records inside of a transaction group do you need a DMU buffer. But across transaction groups, and as long as, a, as the cache decides that a piece of data is interesting, it'll be retained in ZFS's uh, adaptive replacement cache and um, can, be, can be accessed later. So this is the before. I think I was able to explain it in maybe a minute or two minutes, right? Um, here's what it looks like now. It's complex enough that we didn't want to do it in PowerPoint. So we actually used a different tool. And I'm not going to go through all the different state transitions here, but this is like iteration number 10, maybe. Uh, and we, it was a lot more complex before. Anyway, uh, there will be more details about this in the paper that we're working on. And uh, we'll also post the slides, too. And we're also going to post diffs, so you can always uh, go read the code, too. Okay. So this new state transition diagram in place, this new state machine, let's just walk through one of the paths that you might take. Okay. So we start out life with this uncached debuff, uh, DMU buffer. And we're in the open transaction group, and we want to do a modification. So we need a dirty record. So we create a dirty record. And we also need a place to be able to put our data. So we allocate a, um, a separate buffer uh, to associate with that dirty record. We haven't done any reads. We haven't modified it in any way. We can then um, transition. Oh, yeah, actually, let me back up here. It's uncached. Yeah, we, we, I forgot about the state transition. So we were uncached. We mark the fact that we want to modify this buffer for a write. So we say that it's going to be partially modified. That's what the partial state means. And we also or in this fill bit to say that we're still in the process of modifying it. Then we allocate the buffer that we're going to use. The writer sticks in some data. We track what portions of the buffer have been dirtied. And then the writer gets to go on his merry way. And he will exit the fill state and go to the partial state. Over time, additional writers can come in here. So what we've done here is uh, the, the data on the right-hand side of the slide used to be the open transaction group. It is now the quiescing transaction group. And we have somebody in the open transaction group who has written different data. We have not in any way merged the data between the quiescing transaction group and the open transaction group. The ranges are independent at this point. Okay, what has been dirtied in the, in the quiescing transaction group has not been dirtied in the open transaction group. And we can even have three of these, right? We can have one that's being processed by the sinker or is destined to be processed by the sinker and have somebody doing a modification in the, in the open transaction group uh, and have recorded in the quiescing transaction group, yet another version of this particular object. So the sinker eventually comes along and sees this dirty record and says, I need to commit this to disk. So what does he do? He knows it's partial, so he can't write it immediately. What he does instead is he allocates an extra buffer, the read buffer, dispatches a synchronous read. At some point later, the synchronous read returns making this valid with data that from the older version of the block. And then we merge it, maintaining the data that was dirtied in each of the transaction groups. <coughs> but you'll notice when we do this merge that we actually discard the previous buffer that we were using and, go, and use the next one as our reference for the merge. So we're merging now from the syncing transaction group into the quiescing transaction group. And then there's no more merges to do because the guy in the open transaction group has fully dirtied the buffer, and he doesn't need the old data anymore. When this process is complete, we'll transition the, head, uh, the debuff to the cache state, and that means that there's no more resolves and partial dirties or anything else to keep track of anymore. And uh, at that point, the sinker will progress and, and write that particular 
the uh, syncing transaction group's data block out to disk and go on its merry way. But that's not quite optimal, right? We had a synchronous read in there. Synchronous equals bad, right? But it was hard enough just to get that to work that we didn't try to just go for the whole thing in one shot. So let's talk about the issues, right? We, there's a synchronous uh, read that's going on there. Um, why does it need to be synchronous? Shouldn't need to be synchronous. We have a background syncer that's operating. We want to do as much in parallel as possible. We also know that when we make a transition from one transaction group to the next, that if there are unresolved dirty data, if there's unresolved dirty data in a previous transaction group, that we have to have multiple versions of that lock. Do you have need to have multiple versions of that lock, one for the previous transaction group, one for the current transaction group? You can't avoid the read anymore. You got holes in the old guy. So you might as well issue the read now and get it started so you have as many of these reads outstanding in parallel at the same time. The, and to be able to, to kick off those reads, we want writers to be able to notice this situation and very cheaply, without blocking, tell the system, hey, go start the, uh, the res resolution process for these uh, older transaction groups and these dirty records. And finally, by making it asynchronous, we can have the sinker, as it hits uh, records that have not been resolved yet, just very cheaply start the asynchronous read. And when those reads finish, it will then turn around and write the, the finished and, and fully assembled blocks to disk. So there are some complications in trying to do this. Uh, a situation we call split, split brain. Okay? So ZFS, even before these changes, really has uh, multiple personality disorder. Okay. We have multiple versions of an object in flight at the same time, and it's kind of hard to keep straight in your head. You know, somebody wrote this block, and then somebody came along and got rid of it with a truncate, then they wrote it again, and in the middle of that, we were doing a resolving read, but the data from the resolving read is no longer necessary for most of those dirty records, and you can kind of get the idea of how this can get confusing. Um, but we think, with the state diagram that I showed previously, that we have it, have it working. The other complication that we had is that because we want to have allow the sinker as well as a reader or a writer that's coming in on behalf of a user to be able to initiate this background resolve, that by the time the sinker gets around to looking at a dirty record, that buffer may not be ready to be written, but somebody's already started the read, well, he's got to figure out where that read is and then chain it in some way so that when that read completes that he gets his normal sinker processing to write the block back out. And because of some layering uh, issues inside of the DMU, that was a little tricky to be able to do. But anyway. So we did do one other optimization that I'm going to let uh, Will talk about that has to do with asynchronous reads. So two technology um, and three they there has a interface the with the block divided the table to two um IOs and part that um it doesn't play from the rational contact. And with the DFX that has not handled in an optimal manner all of the IOs that are done with um the DFX volume interface were um synchronous. So this uh, diagram shows the original DFX block diagram that we showed a few slides back. So you'll notice here that um, the, at the top level, most of the interfaces are already asynchronous, <coughs> and below that, most of the interfaces are already asynchronous. So the problem that we had was that the GMU layer did not have a callback mechanism in order to be able to implement um, performing a, a is that has I L and parallel. So the idea was that we could implement the callback to make that in the DMU layer. Tom, any questions? <laughs> right. So um, the basic goal was to get as much I L in flight as possible. 
and in fact, there was the overarching goal of uh, the Chaplin right for resolution optimization that looking was just talking about. So with the old optimization, all of the reads were done in parallel. And so the idea here is that when you issue a read to a block device, that you're um, issuing all of the read in parallel, and then they'll get called back whenever they happen to finish. Now the, um, the other, other part of that, other aspect of that uh, work was that we read local stars in the kernel so that um, when the I.O. thread processes in an I.O. request in the FS, what it will do is it will, um, when, it, when it realizes that it's conflated a set of uh, I.O., it will queue those to, to a list. And then what happens is when that I.O. thread uh, goes all the way back up the stack, it will look at that queue in its thread local stars. And it will say, oh, I've got these I.O. that I need to deliver. And you'll be able to did pass all of those deliveries to the original caller in a way that um, avoids lack over that lack order reversals. And in a way that avoids having to pass the, that contact down to all of the all the places that we may need to be able to put those I.O. in that list. And that also avoids the um, lack overhead associated with that, since uh, the thread local storage is specific to that thread. Nobody else can actually look at it. So one, one tricky part about doing that is that when you're trying to issue all of these IELTS in parallel, you have to avoid having one of those IELTS possibly complete before you finish issuing those IELTS. So the way we do that is we get what's called an issuing rep count and then we add rep count for every outstanding I.O. And then in those I.O. space, they drop their rep count. And if they, and regardless of whoever finishes first, uh, I'm sorry, finishes last, they will deliver the I.O. to the user through the callback. So that's what the central part of making the asynchronous callback work. So I'm going to talk about results. I'm sure you're all very excited to do this part. Yeah, the charts and the graphs. Bugs. <laughs> <laughs> the last, the last of bugs. Okay, I'm just going to show you a very quick summary of the uh, many different bug classes that we ran into trying to do all of this. It, it really was a journey. <laughs> okay. And that, that uh, left here is actually incomplete. <laughs> and there are many examples of most of these, and a lot of them are very hard to be solved. So um, the gist of that slide is to talk about how we validated our results. So that's, uh, I think we've uh, pretty adequately trained gear that has a lot of these moving parts all over the place. And it really had one of the most uh, complex pieces of software of both sides. So honestly, I'm sure a lot of people think that when they, can, when they want to check their bus, they're just going to have a bunch of clients trying to crash at it over interface, over uh, step, or locally, or whatever. That's really not a sufficient task. And the reason is because, well, for, for this kind of thing, the junior layer is used by almost everything in GFS. And the reason for that is because it's a transactional nature. So all of the objects in ZFS are managed at the junior buffers. And fundamentally what happens is that when they get sunk to death, they, they get sunk in a way that's transactional. So if you remember from one of the original slides, we think all of the blocks between the data block and the zero block in one, one transaction group, everything between that that the junior block that's associated with that transaction. So what this means is that we have to um, verify as much of the, of the entire file system functionality as possible. So here's our testing. Very exciting topics. So we had 
we plenary uh, ways to verify the results in uh, solar that a text framework that they develop and they have a text suite they develop that text over different parts of the FS and that that is kind of a high level text suite in that it it doesn't uh, directly work with the DFS code while it's doing it. What it's doing is that it's what a normal user might do, like uh, writing blocks from a user space application, uh, um, running the pool DFS, and go on kind of command. So it's got about 300 texts, and we had to port a lot of them to save as this, and we've gotten most of them to pass at this point. And then on top of that, we have Z-Test. And what Z-Test did, it basically, it's a framework to take the entire DFS kernel module and put it in user space. And what that allows us to do is to run the actual junior API call to ensure that they do the right thing. So, um, one complication with Z-Test is that it's not really speaking in unit test because every run that you do, it's going to be different. And the reason for that is because Vitex set you up with the pool, and then he formed up uh, 23 threads. And each of those threads will do different tests simultaneously in the same pool. And sometimes they will do the same test on more than one of those threads at once. So there's a lot of uh, parallelism that goes on there. And in order to verify your results properly, you have to run Vitex hundreds of times. So, um, with XDD, XDD is a program that's kind of like DD, but it's uh, far more powerful in terms of what it's capable of doing with the performance tests. And so what we did with that, that the other two don't do, is that we import a high I.O. over, I'm sorry, high I.O. workload. The idea is what that you would find some bug that were the result of having that kind of workload going on. So, on top of our testing, we wanted to be able to, we wanted to be able to convince ourselves that the changes that we made were correct. And the problem is that with the ZFS, there's a lot of things that I'm coming said or they have wrong comments, or, or their um, naming game is not clear as to what it's doing, or, or so on and so on. And so what, what we try to do is in the DNU layers, in the two layers that we worked on, um, we try to, to uh, clean it up to the point where you could actually read the code and say, oh yeah, I understand that that does. So the other thing is that if the asynchronous DNA works, um, by, by doing that, we are able to unify that API because it would have 10 different APIs for different types of buffers. The idea was to avoid that. We would just have one API that would work for all of the different types of buffers that are getting managed. And on top of that, by having that unified API, you can actually minimize the overhead of the rest counting that Jimmy does. Now the second part involves how we do how we do the blocks in the Jimmy lab. And the idea there was instead of having the nine uh, three hundred nine functions, but a bunch of sub functions, what we do is we work that apart so that instead of trying to handle all the fifty different situations that a block might be in we would have a set left version for each of the different types of blocks that we handle. So the idea was that instead of having it be um, full time, adding more and more layers on, on top of that, you'd have a set left. And you'd say, okay, at this point I've done this, at this point I've done that. And the idea is to make sure that it's actually structured so that you can continue to improve it from that. Performance results. Now, um, keep in mind that the uh, 3D10x is actually 
Deep grabbing the tape that I have that are affected by the drug. It doesn't affect more style I have, but for blood I have, or anything that behaves like blood. For example, databases, or, um, or virtual machine, disk image, things like that, you will see these kinds of improvements. So, the results that follow her for this configuration. There's an important issue about the lab for working them out. So here's the think of that we talk. Now you we'll, know the blue bars are all the before performance, the red bars are the after performance, and the random IOs are unlocked and um, sequential then blue part. So that's it for um think of that testing. We also did 10 thread testing. So the reason why you do that is because uh, having multiple threads increases the performance of random I.O. Because that's why with the changes that we made, all of that is different this will allow the app to know more about what's going on at once and therefore get more, uh, more I.O. through at a time. So if you compare this bar here, Random days in particular benefit from having monopole thread and asynchronous iod. I'm going to turn, it, turn this over to Justin for a uh, commentary on our work. So one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is that our use of ZFS at Spectra, and, and I imagine that lots of components <coughs> that are used, uh, reused from open source, are also are being used in a way that's a little bit different than how ZFS was originally developed. The ZFS code base is, is it's, it's really nice. I mean, it works really well. A lot of really intelligent, smart people worked on it. But they operated in an environment where, for years at a time, a tightly knit group of people who their only, their only concern was ZFS um, operated on this code base. And if you were to step back from that perspective of working on ZFS every day for years at a time, uh, you'd kind of come to the same perspective that Spectra has. So Will and I work on all kinds of different things at Spectra. Um, just recently I was working on Zen. Before that there were some race conditions in CAM or, you know, coming back to ZFS or, you know, we go and work on, on whatever the hot performance or bug issue is of the day. And so when we were working on the ZFS stuff, because it is so complex, we were pretty brutal with the code. Uh, when we talked about, when Will talked about how we refactored it, we wanted to make sure that if we came back in a week or six months, that there was no technical debt defined, and that we could very quickly reload all that state and understand the code. So we spent a lot of time on naming conventions and and restructuring and modifying data structures. So it'll be very interesting when we work to have these changes brought back into FreeBSD and perhaps into Illumos, uh, what the reaction is going to be to that. Because we did not try to be conservative. If we felt that something needed to be restructured, it was restructured. And I think that uh, as, as an open source project, uh, FreeBSD and, and other open source projects also need to keep this in mind that the people who are consuming it can't afford to be 100% devoted to some component at a time. I think that's mostly that. So further work. There's always more to do. So during the performance demo, you might have seen that even though we were doing sequential writes, hundreds of megabytes at a time, we were still doing a small number of reads, maybe 10, 20 or so per second. Those reads can have a pretty significant performance impact on certain types of write loads. If you have enough disks in the back end or have enough uh, write buffering cache and things like that, those reads can actually cause stalls in the IO pipeline and cut your write performance in half. And because there's no metadata in those indirect blocks that we need if we're doing a sequential write workload, we should be able to make the same optimizations that we did for data blocks for the indirect blocks for synchronous writes. The other thing that we should be able to do as well 
is if you're a writer, all that you need, all the system needs to know to allow you to continue with that write is whether it's allowed and if there is buffer space available to be able to stash the write while these reads are going on in the background. And so again, to improve the concurrency of the system and make sure we're doing as much as possible in parallel, we really want to disassociate the reads of those indirect blocks or any other metadata in the system from the writer so we can capture more of his workload and keep it in this pipeline going to the disks. We've also found that there's a lot of copies in the system. Probably the most egregious one is the one that happens uh, during I.O. clustering at the bottom. So we're writing, you know, gigabytes of data per second, whatever, through ZFS, and all of it is written in ZFS record chunks that then get split apart due to RAID transforms. And at the very bottom, we have to bring them all back together. During all those layers, we're constantly copying <coughs> data, and, and, uh, and then uh, because of those copies, we basically lose memory bandwidth and also performance. So you can imagine that at the lower levels of the storage pool allocator, whether it's the, the RAID transforms that are done or the mirroring transforms and things like that, that some of those copies could be eliminated by just passing references to existing data. And that's something that's definitely an avenue for additional work. We've encountered some problems with read prefetch performance in ZFS. We haven't had time yet to really dig into it because these write issues and the asynchronous read issues were uh, our biggest performance bottlenecks uh, from the start. So we really need to go and look at the prefetching code and find out why it is that we're not getting the large IOs that we expect when we're doing these larger sequential read workloads. Hybrid RAID Z is something that was developed at Oracle and is not yet available in an open source form. Essentially what it does is instead of taking a metadata block and striping across all members so that you basically have to read all the members of a RAID stripe to be able to get that metadata block, they mirror it instead. And that way you can get additional IOPS on metadata. And of course they did this for the exact same reason that we're looking at deferring the reads or, or making the metadata reads asynchronous uh, because that metadata really does become a bottleneck for, for performance. Oh. We've also thought about, and I think that um, PJD has also talked about this before, just having a standard RAID 5 or RAID 6 transform so that reads don't require you to read all the data members of a stripe to be able to continue. And again, that would allow additional read IOPS for random reads. Uh, and then there's just tons of other things. Go ask Kirk. So some quick acknowledgments. Um, ZFS really is pretty amazing and, and groundbreaking. Uh, it's unfortunate that, they're, that most of that team has disbanded, but uh, we wouldn't be able to do this kind of stuff without the, work that, the pioneering work that they did. Uh, PJD for the FreeBSD port of ZFS. Um, we, we, came, we, we found a, a few issues, a couple of race conditions, things like that, but if you look at the size of, of, of the code base and the stuff that needed to be implemented and stuff like that, uh, it, it's amazing. Um, the STF framework came from High Cloud Security, which is also using FreeBSD. Uh, we're hoping to push that stuff back into FreeBSD so it can be part of the continuous integration and test framework for FreeBSD. Uh, Illumos, we've gotten lots of bug fixes into the FreeBSD ZFS implementation from Illumos. And of course, Spectrologic for allowing us to work on something this cool. Oh, yeah, I, okay. And we're hiring. <laughs> Questions? Over here. Um, is there any sharing going on uh, with regard to the process of content? Do all the files have been processing and do you have your own process of everything? Are you able to share the whole thing right now? Or do you have to copy it and import it to find it? Okay, so the question was is there any sharing of data in uh, b between the buffer cache? Um, or whether you have to copy data into the buffer cache before you transition it to, to the disk. Do you want me to take that or? Yeah. Okay, so uh, our work basically bypasses the, the upper levels of VM and things like that because we're, we're coming in kind of through this targeted mechanism. If we were to go back here to the uh, slide near the beginning, yeah, this one will work. Um, in our situation, we either come in through and we don't have it listed there, Zen, the Zen block back driver, which then talks directly to ZVols, which is a very thin layer on top of the DMU, and uh, goes into the ARC cache. 
Okay, so as far as like the, the standard VM system issues that some people have doing file I.O., we haven't really done anything to address that. In the case of ZFS, you can do direct I.O. into its cache, the ARC cache, if you um, do intelligent things. Like for instance, let's say that um, I'm a fiber channel uh, LUN that's being presented outside the system and somebody wants to do a, a write. What we can do is if we're operating at this pre presentation layer just above the DMU, we can ask the ARC to give us a buffer in advance. And assuming that we, um, um, well actually because of the copy on write work, we don't even have to fill the whole buffer. We could basically fill that buffer with data from fiber channel or whatever the external uh, item is and pre-populate the cache that way. Um, on reads, you would basically have access to the uh, cached buffer and DMA directly from that out fiber channel or whatever the, the item is. So did I kind of answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Over here? Right, so the question is, why did you choose ZFS for your application since based on how much you work had to put into it, it kind of sucked for it. Um, I think I'm paraphrasing that correctly. Um, the, the choice to use ZFS was actually made before I joined Psychologic. And I think it's, it's one of those cases where, um, and I've seen this in several different environments, where people are like, oh, well, let's see. We want to do this virtualized storage appliance. Hmm. Well, there's this Zen project. There was even you know, all these PhD papers on it. People are using it. It must work. Um, we, need a, we need a file system that will do block and file and, and RAID and volume management. Oh, ZFS does that. So let's just go take that and put those two together. And oh, unfortunately, Open Solaris, Oracle acquisition. Mm, we may better go work on FreeBSD. Oh, but FreeBSD doesn't have any Zen support. So then we better find some people to do some FreeBSD work and put some Zen support in there. And then, oh, yeah, block IO, ZFS, not so good. Maybe fix that too. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, our journey. And um, I don't know. Um, I think it would be very difficult for a team of our size to recreate something like this. So fixing it for us was easier. Well, not for us. Will and I, but for everybody else involved. Other questions up here? Right, so the question is, since your changes were below the presentation layer, uh, they must impact file two. So did you test any of that? And uh, go for it. Um, yes, they do impact the file layer. Fail layer do, and we did, we did put up some of the internal mess up the DNA layer into the file layer, but for the most part, they don't really impact what file is doing. Um, part of the reason for that is because what uh, file layer puts the value of a lot of data, but the uh, DPL layer does read down so that they, that they will request enough buffer from the hub ahead of time and then take the URL data from uh, the file operation and fold that buffer. So for the most part, copy and write both don't happen with file so like the they do with block. Except for the database case. Right, yeah, except for databases and just images and things like that where they have a pre-allocated block and a pre-allocated um, range of uh, data and uh, overriding that constantly. I think that's all I have. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the database thing is going to be pretty significant, we think. So we're very excited to have our Perforce server eventually move over to these changes. Um, we're very close to doing that. And for those kinds of workloads where you're replacing it in place in a file, uh, it does have the exact same kind of uh, data trend that we showed in the graphs for Zvols. Uh, actually, I'm going to have to do him first. So you said that. Uh... Well, I'm hoping they get the YouTube link. <laughs> um, well, I, I have, we, have to, we have to repeat the question. 
Um, back. Sorry, I should have repeated the question for uh, posterity here. Um, so the question is, uh, have you been working with Illumos um, in, in advance or during the work to make sure that it can get merged and things like that? Um, short answer, no. Longer answer, but we are hoping that, that the Illumos community will recognize the value of the sanctions that we have done and the fact that we try to do them in a way that um, relatively operating system agnostic and in a way that's right. We have not tried to, we have not tried to cut corners and I uh, tried to do that right the first time. And it's not just so that you can merge into any more more easily and you know, uh, make it easier for them to accept their work, but it's also so that you can come down the two years from now and actually have a fighting chance of understanding what, what's going on, you know, in a, in a few hours instead of a couple of weeks. I could talk the camera on. So Spectre uses a lot of open source stuff, and we do spend quite a bit of time trying to push stuff back. In the case of the ZFS stuff, just as you know, you saw in one of our slides where we said we didn't break anything almost. What we needed to do here, we went through so many different iterations. It it was just going to be really hard to try to collaborate with somebody outside. Before we even undertook this this work. I actually spent quite a bit of time talking to people about this problem because I didn't want to do the work myself. I had plenty of other things to do, right? And that's true of, I'm sure, most people that, that are consumers of ZFS. And so um, if I were to do it again, uh, maybe I would have sent an email or something like that saying, I'm doing this, it's going to be radical. If you really want to watch, you can. But the sausage making is really ugly on something of this size. And so I think it would be hard for somebody who was not in the day-to-day, -day, trying to track what we were trying to do, um, I think it'd be very hard. There's another question over here. Okay. Oh, you have one more? Um, just to follow up to that, um, a lot of the time, in order to keep up with that, we actually collaborated basically right next to each other a lot. And that, I think it is very important that of being able to develop complicated changes like this is to bounce the ideas off of somebody who's sitting right next to you. And of course, that's one of the big reasons why we come to this you can in the first place. Yes. I just had a little follow up on the other If I end up a file, so it's either right and I modify one byte per page, copy or paste. So the, the pages that I'm modifying, are they stacked by separate from the FS system or are they? Yeah, in the case of memory mapped I.O., I haven't really ha spent any time looking at it. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, what happens with memory mapped I.O.? Are they backed directly by the ARC cache? Um, Kirk, do you, do you know the answer to that? Okay. Right, so they are separate pages at this time in FreeBSD, so they are not coherent in that sense. Uh, I don't know if there are other mechanisms in place right now to make sure that a reader that comes in through a standard read would get the new data or not. So the question is, is this going into FreeBSD regardless of what happens with the Lumos or whether Lumos likes the changes? That would be my desire. Um, I mean, my, my desire is not to, to diverge from the Lumos unnecessarily, but these kinds of changes are necessary. I mean, if you, I mean, an, another question that often gets asked is, well, other people are using this file system like Oracle, right? And they have like the best spec numbers in the world now. They just beat IBM or something on their latest storage device. How do they deal with it? Well, for smaller devices where you can't put in two terabytes of RAM and 10 terabytes of SSD um, to be able to make sure that none of your metadata and most of your hot data is cached, you can't get the performance numbers out of CFS. Uh, and these optimizations still do help you if you have a cache mess. So, um, I think if uh, the only thing I can tell you for sure is that 
as far as SpectraLogic is concerned, if it doesn't go back into FreeBSD, then we'll have a private fork of the file system because we have to have these changes. And there are probably other optimizations like we're listed in the further work that we'll have to do as well. Right, so the question is if Oracle does do another drop of their latest enhancements to ZFS, do we think that they'll be mergeable? And um, there's also a concern about perhaps still having a fork from what Oracle's doing. So I think that since the changes will be based on the old structure, that you'll be able to mostly tease out what has happened there. Um, the, the main issue that we ran into with doing the DMU layer and the debuff stuff is that there are all these mixed concerns all tied together in special case. You'll go in and do it dirty and it'll start doing something and say, oh, but this is a, a spill block or a bonus buffer or a meta denote or something else and do some tiny little thing through four different function calls and then come back and come back into the main thing and then go off again to go handle that special case. So I think that if you can extract the intention of what they were doing, that you should be able to pretty easily apply it to the new structure. And, and maybe that's even easier than how it was before because there's so much clarity now. When you go to dirty a meta denode, well, what's the name of the function? You know, debuff dirty meta denode. And all the steps to do that are, are nicely contained there. Um, I understand that that is not the way to do some I call it done. So I'm sure they'll have to mess around with it. So, uh, sometime in the past, I had run a sweep of the various block buffers uh, doing form of testing, testing, and write testing, and found that the that a that writes of hacking to be recognized had this rather nasty performance degradation. And it was like fairly linear, and then it would be between two bits. Um, have you studied doing any sort of sweeps of block sizes? See if these sort of things would address that problem. Right. So the question is, have we done any sweeps of different block sizes on ZFS to see if some of the um, the behavior that's really suboptimal, especially when you have IOs of half the record size um, have been addressed. So we have done some performance characterization of different block sizes. Usually, um, usually the IOs that are going on are either way smaller than the record size, like 4K or 16K or something like that, um, or they are, they are a, the size of a ZFS record or a multiple of the ZFS record. Uh, so we have not directly looked at that particular problem. Well, yeah, so, so um, is there an expectation that this will help that problem? Absolutely. Uh, the, the behavior that we've seen is that by disassociating the reads with the writer's context, you usually get about a 3x performance improvement. And it all depends on what transform you're using to aggregate your disks. If you're using a RAID-Z transform, it will be less than if you're using some other transform that gives you more places to read uh, metadata in parallel. You know, like you have mirrors, mirrors and things. Not to mention your configuration, if you've got more uh, these tabs, then you have split your higher to class more on those. Um, that. Uh, two slides each. Oh, in the back. Did you have a question, PJD? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay. So PJD says that Oracle will never, will never release the source. <laughs> Justin, do you know if, um, it, on that same same topic, do you know if the Alula sky has actually had any sort of plan or work or anything going on with the sky like that? So the question is, do we know of any of the plans of Alumos' plans for what to do with ZFS and things like that? Uh, I have to admit that in trying to do this work. Um, I wasn't looking anywhere else, except for occasionally in Zen and in CAM and all the other places that bugs cropped up while we were trying to do this. So uh, I really know as much as Google will tell me if I do a search.
Right, so the question is, do we have any more benchmarks about you know, when you connect a VM to it or a database and things like that? Uh, we do have some, I'm trying to remember if I have them in some place really convenient that I can show you. Um, Ken, do you have any rough numbers, like per just percentage differences or whatever? Yeah, so, so um, my recollection, um, the last time that we did these numbers, because we were trying to optimize for Windows VMs that were backed by ZFS storage, is that sequential I.O. would top out maybe in the 30 megabyte a second range, regardless of the NTFS cluster size that you used, regardless of how sequential the I.O. was. Some of that was because of uh, not so great things happening in the PV drivers, but uh, the majority of it was due to copy on write faults. And we're now able to do 450-ish or something like that, um, depending on how much metadata is cached. And that's without any SSDs and a very small amount of RAM, you know, four gigabytes of RAM in our storage domain. And, you know, enterprise class SAS drives, but slow ones, you know, 7200 RPM, stuff like that. There's still a lot of tuning that we have to do in the system. You're, you're not quite there yet. Other questions? Okay. Go ahead, you uh... oh. Damn it. Too fast, man. I got it, I think. No? Um, we, we actually have a uh, public dialogue, so I was going to show you the last slide. But then it'll go past the end, won't it? Uh, yeah. Too many slides. There we go. Uh, so the URL that's up there actually has um, a pointer to the, to the disk and there are still a few minor bugs. Uh, it works pretty well, though. So, very soon. Thanks again.